<laughs> right. I've, I've passed my Dutch 101, so yay. yay. I'm <laughs> swinging a dead cat overhead, so you can have good mojo. That is a reason. Sandwich, then. Yeah. Dutch. Just I mean, out of camera. Just out of I camera. I speak so. German, and I wouldn't dare approaching Dutch. You know, you go <laughs> stuff here. <laughs> well, the the the, Flan the Flanderian version is softer, apparently. But the problem is that I, I keep getting told you have to pronounce every syllable, and then of course, every word has letters <laughs> that you don't pronounce as well. So, but, you know, I say, like, hang on, you tell me these rules. Yes, but it's not just about the rules. <laughs> you can't. You can't win. It's good. I mean, English is a really difficult language to learn in, in sort of the realm of world languages. It's got so many damned exceptions and so many weird things about it. Um, but not yeah, there's, a one, there's, there's a wonderful poem that has all the different pronunciations of O-U-G-H. And, you know, the, the, mm. and so when you read it, um, it's not like this or like this or like this. It's like this. And it's quite a clever poem. Yeah, yeah it's lovely. So, I'd love to see that. Yeah. I'll, I'll dig it out. I've got it somewhere, but I haven't got the link in front of me. It's very likely easy to Google. Um, so this is the OGM check-in call for August 27th, 2020. Uh, people are going back to school, sort of. Schools are reopening, sort of. It is a weird moment in time. Uh, I'm noticing Ken is indoors, not in his backyard, very likely for natural causes. Yep. Smoke. Yep. It's really smoky out there. Oh, oh. man. Um, just crazy. So let's do let's do a, a brisk round of check-ins, and I'd love today to go into um, to do a, bit, a little bit of barn raising on two topics. Uh, one topic is guilds, like what is a guild? How do we do it? Uh, let's frame up some guilds. Let's put them on discourse. Let's sort of get that kind of shaped. Uh, and the second one is, and I don't, I'm not sure what to call it, but focus areas. And uh, we've got a call tomorrow. Uh, Klaus sort of stimulated a focus uh, conversation, an OGM call tomorrow on soil, soil fertility, the food system, regenerative agriculture, uh, and all that. And that, that feels like a, you know, everything from soil to climate change feels like a nexus of activities. And I don't know what to call these, nexi, nexies. Uh, and then another one that's clearly a nexus. Domains. Um, uh, domains is, is probably our, our best bet. Uh, and then another one that feels like a clear nexus right now is education. Uh, and we're doing some, we're playing some with Chico Lab, with Charles and Lauren on, on that. So I'd love to create that as a place where we can gather and, and hold those conversations uh, in, in, you know, on our, on our platform, but probably in discourse as well. So uh, that's kind of what I was hoping we would do when we uh, get to chat. So let's do a, a rapid round of check-ins and I'll start at the bottom of my screen uh, with Kevin, Hank, Jay. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> so our credit union continues to grow. People are, we're getting customers who are putting in a quarter million dollars because it's easy to bank black with no cost and no risk, but they get loans out to folks that the white banks don't work with. So that's the, that's happening. They're trying to uh, get it. We're getting a big rush from Palm Beach to bring it there. Um, and the way I do these things, I've gotten kind of a model that I'm, we call a, a, a field guide to transformation. And I'm actually being encouraged to make that into a book. And I'm doing an hour a day and I'm on day four or five now. And um, it's making sense. I mean, it has to sort of be personal of how I got to this point to think that I have a plan. So that's kind of kind of. It's, it's a hard thing to think about that exactly. It's a, it feels kind of, but I mean, I've got this approach and it's working repeatedly. So I, I, people say they want to hear about it. So I'm writing it. I, That's for it. one, would Thanks. love to read your autobiography. Or your, your, yeah, your, your, there's a lot of stuff in there about how I got there. So it's- Your focused like memoirs. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mem memoirs in a field guide. Sounds like a really good- <clears> Memoirs in a field guide, yeah. Yeah, love that. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, who was uh, Hank, then Jay? And Hank, you're muted. You may be away from the, there we are. Nope, I'm here. Cool. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, quick check-in from me. Um, a little, little, I'm off video today. Um, I am in the middle of packing things up for a move. So my, my, my usual background is in a bit of disarray. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to be a bit of a lurker today. A lurker slash, you know, personal note taker, I think for me. Um, but uh, that's, that's that for me. Awesome. Short haul move or long haul move? Uh, medium, let's say. 
like I'm just moving from Providence to Boston, so it's only an hour, and I don't oh, okay. have, I don't have a ton of stuff, but um, you know, it's just like logistics, cool. given everything going on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so J. Charles Scott. Good morning, everybody. Um, two things. Number one, trying to organize uh, dome schooling for my daughter, who's eleven. So uh, putting up a geodesic dome in the neighbor's uh, yard and because uh, ours is too sloped and um, just having space and distance there. Um, so that's exciting. Um, the second part is I'm putting out a storytelling journal. Uh, it's kind of my idea that of how to spread this in a non-technological way is how do we get people to be able to gather their stories for whatever purposes they're doing them. So. I'm in the midst of a, of a launch on that and uh, happy to be here. That is awesome, thank you. Uh, Charles, then Scott, then Doug. Over here, it's all about the Flow Show at the Kiko Lab, uh, which we launched um, with some of you on Monday. It's the next three Mondays. Um, Noontime Pacific is the official session time. We have the story room at um, 2 p.m. Pacific. 11 p.m. Central Europe. Uh, the other components uh, emerging are the biz flow, uh, tech flow, play flow, kind of everything's flow in the flow show and kind of just looking through these different lenses, definitely uh, with Lauren and the hash bins, the hash verse, um, just dropping a lot of kind of buzzwords on Kiko Lab ontology out there, but um, it's exciting. We're getting some wonderful people. Um, um, yeah, between the, the kind of um, the story and the, the, the online, the, the, the unlearning pods, whatever we're going to call them next, it's not going to be learning pods. That was a kind of a, a mini consensus. Um, the cool laboratory, by the way, is also happening um, on Sundays with actual real kids, our own and others. And, um, but then, yeah, the, the big kids get to huddle around the, the sort of the, the making of that uh, on Mondays. So that's me. Love that. Check. Feel free to put a bunch of links in the chat so that people can follow you to the invites and to the places and whatever is being built. Yeah, um, yeah, we're getting that together. There's a new, there's an email newsletter is the main thing. Um, so anyone um, send me their email list, or email address for the list. Thanks. Okay, cool. And then we can you can put them on the list. Awesome. Uh, Scott, Doug, Pete. Morning, everyone from Airlock in Michigan. Um, I don't really have much to share this week because I've been busy with other stuff, which I'm fortunate um, that work has come in the door after a long dry spell. So uh, two things to share, thank you, that's uh, popped up just now. Um, so I've never heard of Eric Hoffer before. Um, and it was interesting that in my little browser that has a little quote of the day and a beautiful picture, it said, Someone who thinks the world is always cheating them is right. They are missing that wonderful feeling of trust in someone or something. And it said, oh, Eric Hoffer. So I'm gonna copy and paste that into the little chat window because I thought that was particularly interesting for our group. And it led me down a path where I found another quote from him which seemed even more relevant to us, which is, in times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. So, yes, there you go. And here's the quote. Yes, the, the cheating quote for sure. Um, and the, the other one that I just discovered on the learning, I will also paste that in. And but, yeah, he's, like also, that. he's also um, relevant because he wrote this book, The True Believer, which is really interesting about basically we fear chaos in the mob, social movements, et cetera, fanaticism. Mm. Really interesting, interesting there as well. And okay. thank you. And just a tiny uh, deviation. He was a stevedore and the root of stevedore is Portuguese and it's an estivador, uh, a longshoreman. That's, that, that's the people who loaded up ships and unloaded ships, uh, but the, the roots are Portuguese. Interesting. Well, okay. so his writings were, were in the thirties uh -huh. and, and in that point, you know, as you know, what do I say? Uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, um, you know, and, and he's talking about how the, you know, in these times of change, the learners will inherit the earth. And, you know, 
it, the change never stops changing. And I think that, that that's a flaw in a lot of people's thinking that, that, well, when everything settles down, this is going to be great. So, all right, that's cool. all. Thanks, Scott. And that's yep. the thesis of, of the book that April's writing is that the change keeps changing and is getting mm -hmm. changed. Flux, flux ever, mindset. Ever, yes. ever changier, exactly. Um, Doug, Pete, Mark. Okay, I'm back home after the fires, which was pretty amazing. As you learn to look at every gust of wind for a sign as to what's actually happening. It's kind of like a war zone. Your senses are really up high. Uh, so that was pretty amazing. I've been uh, dealing at the end of that with uh, trying to learn how to use Rome, which has been kind of fun and interesting. The main thing is I gave a seminar yesterday on Latour's uh, Down to Earth book, which I still think is an extraordinary framing. Why we are where we are and how we can pull ab apart our political categories to have more relevant divisions among us that we can then fight over. Uh, I just highly recommend this book. So th that's it for the week. Awesome, I'll put a link to this <clears throat> in the chat. Um, Pete, Mark, Ken. Uh, it's been an interesting week. I've had some great side conversations with uh, folks from uh, OGM and Kika Lab. Um, Talking largely around tools, uh, uh, the Friedrich's Brain uh, Guild um, and uh, Wiki Nature. Um, so that that's been a lot of fun. <clears throat> uh, I also uh, finished up the first phase of that trans the transcription of the um, sense making call uh, with uh, Phoebe Tinkle and Dave Stone. Um, so. It was uh, really cool finishing that, and now I'm looking forward to, now I've got the kind of the foundation on which I can go back and annotate it and, and to make it richer. So that's, that's the fun part. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks, Pete. Um, and last night I, I finally got to watch Max, uh, Max's analysis of one of our calls where he took the transcript and then mapped it into Miro as a as a, basically a conversational map with swim lanes for each participant and then how think how the conversation bounce back with the conversation as post-its in the swim lanes uh, which is super interesting and i would love at some point to 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 do what you're doing pete sort of take a slow close read of an important conversation and see what we all can can do with it and i think that's where you're heading right it's like yes here's an artifact we can play with like that and then let, let's actually Let's play with something in some depth so we can start to see where, where it takes us. Um, Steven Kritzer, I think I've got his name right, um, has got an interesting take on that where he's done some of that, something similar with OGM calls. Um, his focus is not on, we actually had an interesting discussion in email a little bit. Um, the thing that that I found, especially with that call, uh, even uh, OGM calls but and, and that call, um, there's so many ideas that flow through and so much rich stuff that it's like I kind of need to like go back over the recording, slow it down and be able to capture it and just have a clean, decent transcript of it. And then I can actually look at it and absorb some of the thoughts and things like that. Um, so m m I felt like that was a process of denoising the conversation, um, both kind of um, in the speech and also temporarily. Um, being able to like go back and say, okay, you know, I can I can read this part over and over and over until it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so Stephen's got a different approach where uh, I think what he does is he listens to the the call and he makes notes about the ideas that are flowing past. He doesn't really care too much who is making the ideas, um, and he captures those into a spreadsheet, and then he can take the spreadsheet of ideas and start stop times and produce a automatic kind of a uh, supercut of it. You know, here's Jerry saying this, here's Tom saying that, here's, you know, and it and it kind of flows. The the t tool setup is kind of jerky right now, but it's an interesting take at at also, you know, grabbing the the good stuff out of a conversation. Max and I have also talked a little bit about the idea of real time uh, transcription, um, mm -hmm. which I would be super jazzed to kind of uh, set up. So, I'm looking at some ways to do that. This sounds like a juicy topic for us. Thank you. Thanks for the exploration. Briefly, uh, Kevin and Charles, then back to uh, Mark, Ken, Judy. So Kevin, you're muted. Uh, you're actually not muted here. We just can't hear you. Uh, 
Okay. Sorry. Uh, we still can't really hear you. No. We could hear his stomach. Okay. There. Now okay. we hear you. Good. Okay. I, I just wanted want to put out a uh, one vote for the flow as it goes, and not putting any sense or order on it afterwards. I really enjoy the flow, and just going with it rather than any sense making afterwards. So that's 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 my vote. I seem to be relatively unique in that perspective, but that's okay. I like it the way it happens. Um, I don't think we're talking about changing the nature of the conversations. I think we're talking about what we do, like what happens in post. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I understand. I just like it the way it is and, and not, to, not to do that. Okay. Uh, cool. Why, Kevin, why is that? I just would like to understand what's the philosophy behind it. You know, I, I, when I let it sift down into its own sense making rather than put a frame around it, I get more out of it. Mm. So it's your person. It's it's kind of your personal process of digestion and 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 sense making Metab metabolization and sense making yeah. within your own yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. It, it 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 makes sense if I let it do its thing as opposed to put it against a grid. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank a you. People a couple people I don't think well in grids. So, go ahead, Charles. Um, sense making is in the flow of the beholder, <laughs> or something like that. I, like that. And, I love um, it, Charles. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and by the way, Kevin, uh, please come around to the flow show. It's definitely all about the flow. It's there is some structure, but um, with with breathing, and that's one of the basic rules: is keep breathing. But um, let's see. The, <laughs> Just so go to add, Charles. About, that oh, fine. You have a bias for oxygen breathers. Vice versa yeah, is okay. also. Well, I thought you were inclusive. Anyway, sorry. Right. <laughs> vice versa oh. is also true, it, Charles, that the, it, the, the, flow, the flow is in the sense making of, of, the, of the perceiver. Okay, I, I, I'm with it. It's, it's mm. cool. Yes, and that's another rule left over from and, Lauren. Uh, so, but I just want to say about editing, I think um, all of these things involve uh, sort of instant editing as soon as we open our, our senses. And um, so, you know, there's no, I think there was a thread a while back in the, in the forum about objectivity and, um, but so not to get too philosophical, but um, flagging what Pete was talking about in, in refer reference to Stefan Kreutzer and also um, Max Harper and, and uh, some of us at Kiko Lab around the tools and map mapping conversations. That's definitely a part of, of what we're about in the flow show um, in the segment around kind of tech flow and um, map map flow and so forth. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this is sort of real quickly to Matt. I think I have a sedimentary sense making that works. And, and other people are more igneous perhaps. Um, very cool. So let's go back to our check-ins. We have, uh, we got Doug, we got Pete. So Mark, Ken, Judy. Okay. Um, so, you know, you're probably aware of the fact that, that in the climate change space, there's been a huge ballooning recently of literature from the financial community, the financial risk community, the central banking community, all these people are suddenly talking about climate change and uh, in a way that they really never have before and systemic risk and all sorts of stuff. And I've, this week I've been integrating some of that new literature into the climate web and we go through the documents and pull out key graphics and key ideas and organize this stuff so you can sort of get a sense of what's going on without having to read three dozen new reports, which who does? Um, but what's really struck me is, as I've been doing that, is that even though these people are talking about climate change, they're talking about it still within their silo. And so, you know, Einstein once said that you can't solve a problem with the tools that created the problem in the first place. And yet all of this discussion from the financial community about climate change is, is talking about how we'll use economic models to figure out what's going to happen and what, you know, what the impacts on monetary policy might be of climate change and you know, how do we manage all of this stuff. And so it's all just being added as one more risk variable that we'll manage with the tools that we have um, as the financial community and the financial risk community. And that, you know, that just so fundamentally misses the point of what climate change is about and what the potential climate change, the impl potential implications of climate change are from a systems perspective, that at the end of the day, it really, it's almost a bad thing that this is, that suddenly we're spending a lot more time on the financial risk side 
But what it's really going to do is just lull us into the idea that, well, we've got that taken care of. Uh, and in, in practice, we won't have it taken care of at all. And, and so it sort of comes back to the, the OGM question of how do you break people out of these silos and, and get them to sort of take a broader perspective to, to some of these problems? Um, that sounds really important and if we can go back to it later, but I'm really interested in whether Doug um, sees that happening in his communities because Doug, Doug is a shepherd of economists and uh, among, among other skills. And I'm, I'm just really interested in how that goes because if they're blind to the causes of the situation that run right back to finance and they're not having that conversation, we are like well and royally screwed. Um, uh, or, or can we can we help them wake up that conversation? So, so, Mark, so in a sen in a sentence, yes, I totally agree with that. The economists have a view of the economy of the flow of money for the rich, so it leaves out everybody else. And of course, you can't get a solution of the problems within that narrow confine. You've got to go broader, and economists don't know how to do that. Interesting. And Kevin and Kevin's work is trying to interrupt that flow so that the wa water metaphorically flows to other communities and through, et cetera, et cetera. So, so back, we're back to flow. Uh, and Eddie, uh, Ken, Judy, uh, Peter, Peter Van. Hello, everybody. Wow, uh, there's already so much to comment on here. We haven't gotten through the check-in. <laughs> That's how- A, a how, couple of things that floated like through it. my mind were um, hearing, uh, free Jerry's brain and I instantly had this picture of a, of a t-shirt with you know Jerry's face on it looking up and, and the top of his head and, and the, the brain just coming out of his of his mind I think we need a graphic designer to, to create that for us um, um, I this uh, thing about climate change is very real to me you know uh, I've been in California for 30 years and this is the worst fire season I've ever seen you know it is August and we've got uh, so much 350 some odd fires burning in California we're at what, maybe one degree centigrade over where we've been for the last few thousand years. And what's gonna happen when we hit two or three? I'm really convinced we're in the Pyrocene and um, that the Anthropocene was very quick. We're now in the Pyrocene, everything is on fire. So I'm very curious of how we can uh, work with that effectively to, um, to cool things down. And then, you know, I've been working for the census and I am just stunned by the level of dysfunction in this uh, government organization. We have phone calls. We were having phone calls daily. Now we're told, no, um, we're going to have them uh, only three days a week and they're going to be shorter. And we said, well, what about all of our questions? I'm part of a cohort of 25 field supervisors. And they said, well, basically we can only answer a few questions per day. So we have people in the field asking us questions and we can't get information to answer those questions from our supervisors and they can't get it from theirs. And so it's like someone really is very intentionally, you know, putting a monkey wrench in this thing. Um, just as one really brief example, there's a report I can access on how performance is going, but it's a custom report. It's inside the iPad. There's no way to get it out. Uh, I'm trying to read an iPad, you know, screen like this, and the report is a huge spreadsheet, and there's it doesn't have any columns, um, labels that lock. So as you scroll, you lose what you're seeing, either you know in rows or columns, and it does say export to CSV. I'm like, great, can I export that to CSV? Send it to you in the internal communication system, then you mail that to me so I can see it on my personal computer on my Excel spreadsheet, and the answer is no. So they've got stuff locked down. They will not share information which makes that report basically useless to me. And I have people saying, how am I doing? And it's like, it's, it's a six hour admin task to just go through and figure out what, how 25 people are doing when it can be done in three minutes. I'm just, my mind is boggled. So um, you can probably hear a little frustration around this. It's been a big deal for me this week. Anyway, that's some of the stuff going through my mind. I'm, I'm also feeling a, a sense that I'm fighting of missing stuff because I've been so busy. I haven't had a chance to come and be with in the flow lab or on discourse or all these other things. And, and so I have to remember a conversation I had with a mindfulness teacher about 25 years ago about going to different mindfulness retreats. And she said, if you're in the present moment, you're not missing anything. So I try to just be in the present moment and, and not miss anything, but I am missing some of you guys all the time. Thank you, Ken. That's awesome. Uh, Judy, Peter, Neil. And Judy, you're, you're muted. A couple of thoughts. Um, the busyness is in one way exciting 
but it's also frustrating because what I find is that everything I start doing has at least five dendrites coming out from it that I want to pursue. And so I'm, I, I like what was said about the flow, but I think we might want to actually keep track of the dendrites from topics in addition to the topic itself, because there's a lot of richness in that complexity that would help us figure out how to be useful because at least we see the topic and the complexity and can perhaps find some ways to frame it to make it more attainable to larger audiences of people. Um, uh, I'm also really trying to figure out how to actualize in social movement a lot of the things we're talking about. And that's another whole dimension of this. That's not like my learning more about it, but how do I get six other people to want to learn about it and then they each get six and so forth. So, and maybe learning is the wrong word, but I don't mean it in a traditional sense. <laughs> um, engagement, excitement, enthusiasm, creativity, because in the complexity of different viewpoints is where a lot of the creativity occurs. Thank you, Judy. And the first part of what you said um, triggered uh, my use of the brain where I have that a lot because it's, it's sort of divergent. But then because I've been using it for a long time, I have a bunch of convergence and crystallization, I call it, mm -hmm. where something, something suddenly gets simpler because I realize what the descriptor is that collapses a bunch of things. I, I, I create a better collective noun. I create some nexus that simplifies. And suddenly um, it's, it's like I've bridged the, the hyphae into, and made a little bit more sense out of them. And, and that, those are exciting moments in the use of the tool over time. Um, so I like that a lot. And I haven't had the experience of doing that with other humans in the medium, which is part of the goal of ODM. It's like, how do I do that with you all? You know, any of you who are, who are curating spaces like this. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Peter Van, uh, Neil, then Peter Van, how about that? Just, just one, 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 quick, one quick comment on that. Um, the dendrites uh, that you were talking about, Judy, uh, flow. And then what you were just talking about there, Jerry, we're talking here about the same process that works for neural pathways. Yeah. And so the neural pathway is the weaving together of the strands as the, as the signal becomes stronger because the sense making is more recognized. And so we have the, the plasticity and the neuroplasticity to be able to make these connections. We have multiple perspectives provided we hold the space for those multiple perspectives. And we also have the, the tools to be able to show this was the way I saw it last week. This is the way I, I see it this week. And here's the richer picture that I can make with the pieces that were already in front of me. And uh, if I can weave that into the connection then with um, uh, where I've been at, uh, I've got a poem to share later, by the way, that uh, weaves some of these things around flow, fires um, and climate grief. Um, so when the time is right, I'll, I'll drop that in. But the um, I've just come off a call with um, uh, Michelle Bowens that most of you here will know from Peer to Peer Foundation. Uh, in which OGM came up as, a, as an exemplar. Um, he wants me to help with some visualizations around the peer-to-peer -peer wiki. And so we were in conversation with Johan Branstead, who is the, the, the maker creator of uh, Miro. And so we've just had an hour and a half conversation with the Miro creator. Um, and so what I'm seeing here is a convergent evolution um, between what's happening with uh, the online global mind and with the peer-to-peer -peer wiki and there's multiple other uh, sort of multi-perspectival uh, collaborative type processes around that have information in chunks that are looking for both the how to group but what is the red thread and at where does the red thread go at the next level and how do we weave that with other things to make a new pattern and what level of meaning does that hold for whomever is seeing it from whatever level of flow or discernment they're seeing. So I'm seeing some really interesting uh, at this stage loose and fuzzy uh, convergent evolution between the sort of things that need to be done to make these sorts of compendiums more easily uh, comprehensible uh, less, uh, what was the word that came up? Um, uh, overwhelming to the, to the newcomer. You know, how do I make sense in this amazing uh, landscape of all these new objects, each of which has a depth to it that I can't quite discern? And key players in this right now are Jerry and Michelle, 
who are the intuitive fuzzy logic interfaces with the, the information that's being curated, collated, and now is looking to be structured. So I just want to share that I'm in a couple of these conversations and sensing into this, but again, this issue of the narrative, poetry, uh, visuals, finding different ways of articulating complexity for multiple levels of meaning, not to force it into one structure, but to allow multiple entry points and multiple lenses to see it. And if we can accelerate the rate at which people can see and make sense faster from their own perspectives, we'll faster generate new models, which can then become new evolutionary uh, test beds for uh, adaptation, given the, the challenges we're all under. Uh, so did you comment? Well, I just wanted to comment because I think there's a nugget maybe in here in the sense that the way we make sense as a collective group right now is we, we do the dendrites, we come back, we converge, we resort, we pursue one dendrite over another and so on. But in trying to reach other people, maybe we need to visualize the complexity of a concept with a bunch of things inside the circle so that people own that this is, this is interesting because it's complex. And there's a way to maybe invite people into the circle that would help us reach a lot more people. Uh, Neil, briefly, because this is such a juicy topic that we need to actually just focus on it and have time to talk about it properly, but go ahead. Just, just very quickly, picking up what Judy said, yes. Um, and if you imagine this as a tree with flows, uh, we're bringing global resources down to ground and where they hit the ground become real communities. Right, and then at the same time, are getting feedback from real communities that come back up through the trunk. And to me, the the, the threads, the dendrites, are the quickening process where we're bringing together multiple strands, weaving them together. Has to be structurally sound, but it has to be flexible enough to branch out and absorb more. And it has to have roots that can actually draw stuff through. And if we can't land this, it's not going to be real. And so it has to be grounded. At the same time, we have to be aware of the atmosphere around us. I want to add to your image, and they're aspens or birches because every dendrite goes and grows a new tree. So we could have a lot of fun with that. Exactly along those lines. Uh, yesterday, I was, the day before yesterday, I was looking for an image of dendrites or hyphae or something like that. And I ended up with basically a nice diagram of how mushrooms happen. And it's, you know, mycelia are the, the networks of mushroom material in the ground. The mushroom is the fruiting body. So the mycelia go up create a fruiting body, which then creates little endpoints that drop spores for reproduction. And the hyphae are the leading edge of the little filaments that go ahead and, and, and do the connections. But, but in, a, in, a, in an interesting sense, the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation wiki is a mushroom along this, this sort of mycelial network, et cetera, et cetera. And you can think of these objects that we think of as a thing uh, that might have a culture, that might, that might have you know, governance mechanisms and all that as mushrooms uh, in this field. Uh, which is interesting. And then uh, second, one of the things I really want to do with OGM is to bridge to other organizations. Um, I, Michelle and I go way back. I love his peer-to-peer -peer wiki. Um, I have many, many links into the peer-to-peer -peer wiki in my brain. Uh, and, would, uh, and this project, if they're focused on trying to visualize things that are happening in peer-to-peer in -peer wiki, that sounds like a really, really great thing that we might want to jump into and visualize with other tools, do other stuff. So if, if you wouldn't mind building a, a small bridge so that we can sort of include some people from there in our conversation and then help them do what they're doing, that would be fabulous. I think that would be really- Con Consider it being built. Thank you. That would be phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, Super. And, and did you did you have anything else you wanted to check in with? Just that we had um, a decent rainfall for the first time in about six weeks. So I've been able to slowly start to catch up with things because I haven't had to do quite as much hands on watering around the place. Um, just the feeling of aliveness that comes from the garden when they get a bit of nitrogen enriched water into them. Um, and so instead of having to go out and check every lunchtime and then water every evening for two hours, you know, to actually see how things literally just burst into life. Um, just a quick example, you know, zucchini flowers on, on the plant one day, zucchini six inches long the next. It's like, where the hell did that come from? It's like, it's like a guy blowing those long balloons, you know, sort of, suddenly it appears. So um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. There's a latent desire for life and it's just waiting for the right uh, nutrients and water. If you planted any magic beans, beware for the giant sauce tomorrow. <laughs> um, 
Peter Van, Tony, then Klaus. Um, yesterday we had the, the shooting, uh, the video shooting of one part of the Cybos uh, Pirate TV program that we are building. That was quite an experience. Like uh, the cameraman was in Los Angeles and the production team was in New York and I was in Belgium steering <laughs> and interviewing Anne Pendleton to get her messages across. Uh, uh, a learning here, I'm always trying in the, the sort of events, whether they're online or offline, that I produce is to uh, stretch the speaker uh, to bring their message in a format that they're not used to. Um, and usually what happens is that because there is that stretch, the speaker does extraordinary things in a positive sense. Um, and so the, 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 the trick that worked yesterday was saying, I don't want you to talk over your slides, but we are doing exactly the opposite. You talk and we will add the images on top of your words yeah? and not the other way around. Uh, some other things that are happening, I'm experimenting with another form of pirate TV. Uh, it's around art. So I'm going to invite artists in residence, in virtual residence, to share uh, their studio and sort of things that they have been working on, lessons learned. The Bali thing is still alive. Uh, at this moment, I'm uh, pairing up the content experts with um, an artistic person. So like Robert Poynton, I'm pairing him with Amber Case, to give an example. And so we are at this moment at a stage that we are um, trying to create two minutes uh, beta versions of Pirate TV. So it totally we have four subjects to four times two is like an eight minutes trailer commercial of what we have in mind with four different artists so that they each give their own way of supporting the content. Um, and for the rest, I'm playing around a lot with, I'm following an online course in Final Cut Pro, in Logic Pro, lots of music patterns. I mean, it's amazing what's going on. I'm having fun. That is awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, Tony, then Klaus. And then uh, I've been uh, just uh, on, on a, looking at my personal investment portfolio. Bonds ain't paying nothing. So I'm looking at uh, using several products that involve options to generate income streams that are not dependent upon interest rates. Because bonds ain't going to be paying anything for a long time. That's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll all need good financial survival strategies. Uh, Klaus, then Matt. Uh, sorry, Klaus, then Julian, then Matt. Yeah, a couple of things from, from the food world. Um, I think you know, everyone is tracking uh, these uh, climate events that are, that are hitting us you know, one wave after the next, but uh, I'm focusing on what does that do to the food supply. So Iowa has already lost over 50% of its annual crop. In addition to that, it has gotten wiped out uh, a number of silos. California is on fire and produces over 50% of the US uh, uh, produce. Uh, some key crops, 80, 90% range like tomatoes, artichokes, broccoli, and so on. Uh, the storm coming in right now uh, into the Gulf State will take out another few million acres of crop land. Uh, in the before, uh, just just uh, in time in time before the harvest, um, you look in the North Africa, the Sudan region. They have been devastated by locusts and, and got lost almost their entire crop for the year. So when you look at this in aggregate, what's happening across uh, across the planet right now? We are in for. Uh, uh, food shortages that uh, um, haven't really been discussed and, and no one uh, seems to be focusing on. 
Um, another thing I wanted to share, I'm in this uh, forum, about 80 members or so, consisting of uh, a number of NGOs. It's hosted by the Sierra Club, but we have you know, the Green New Deal, Sunrise Movement, and, uh, and, and you know, Regeneration International, Organic Consumer Association, and so on. But um, in this group, you know, it's a grassroots action team. So we're trying to put uh, things on the ground uh, that, that actually uh, have an impact. And we keep getting stymied because uh, you have the animal rights activists, you have the vegans, and so you have so many different interest, interest groups who kept neutralizing each other. So the uh, Organic Consumer Association finally volunteered you know, to, to put up a webinar um, to focus specifically on vegans and vegetarians uh, and, and how can you, you know, frame your mindset about what it is that you think about uh, your, your, your neighbor, you know, who is an omnivore, uh, and how can you live in peace and, and create a joint strategy to move forward. And so uh, we, we did this webinar a couple of days ago, and we had three uh, speakers who don't normally show up in a nonprofit unpaid role to, uh, to participate. And I would really recommend, I'm putting it online here, it's a one hour uh, conversation, but you have three deep systems thinkers here who uh, in narrative form explain what they see and, and how they uh, would recommend for us to embrace a mindset that allows us to collaborate. So for, you know, for anyone interested in the conversation tomorrow around food, I would really uh, 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 recommend you, you listen in on this because it will give you a deep insight into the struggles of the food world. Thank you, Klaus. That's, um, that's really rich. I appreciate that. Um, Julian, then Matt. Well, this is different. For the last two weeks, I've been focused on the annual computer graphics conference called SIGGRAPH. And uh, uh, one of the things I've noticed is that there's an increased interest in history in this group, which is coming up on being 50 years old. And then, of course, my particular bent is what is the backing structure of uh, however you store all of the knowledge of that history and how the different parts of it relate to each other. SIGGRAPH so, um, still has uh, today and tomorrow to run, so I don't actually have anything to report yet, except some interesting ways of visualizing that, but not managing it, um, which, which is quite different, right? In a, in a group where you're trying to have a living way of storing information, you need management, not just visualization. So I would hope to have some, some more news next week. Cool, and thanks for reminding me of SIGGRAPH. I think I attended one once a really long time ago, and and saw a couple of things that, that came back later. I saw one project, I think, called Mandala, where I stood in front of a green screen and could play instruments and all that. And oh, yeah. Later that was quite a while ago, Jerry. Long, You're dating yourself. <laughs> like 99 or something like that. Yeah. It was ages ago. Really cool. Um, it, it's, it's sort of like there's a lag period between when you see it in SIGGRAPH and when it shows up as Microsoft Connect or something like that. <laughs> um, Matt, your turn. And you're muted. I'm starting a broadcast here real quick. Um, you know, I've been thinking, um, I think I've been thinking a lot about structure um, and how do we get ourselves structured and, um, you know, moving things. And I sort of see that there are these three sort of big areas of, of, of structure. One is over here, um, which is this idea of that there are these domains of action. And a domain of action is an area, and they're probably viewed in, from a systems theory standpoint, our subsystems, right? So we have the food system, we have an education system, we have the money system, health system. I, I wonder about the environment isn't, isn't, in some ways it's the meta system that we're all living in if we, if we think about it. And I think about work that we've done across, right? Kevin, we're talking a lot about the money system. Klaus, you were talking about the food system right, um, the education system that we've been playing with as well. So we have to define all of those systems and we don't have to build them all at once, but those are the, in some ways, these domains of change are the consumers, uh, not consumers, because Jerry, I said that before, but they are the, 
benef the, the beneficiaries, that's probably the right way of saying it, it's the beneficiaries of what OGM is, right? Because that's where the rubber meets the road. I think it's like when we are talking about, um, you know, on the ground level kind of stuff. Then I think you have two sort of bodies of, um, that are serving, you know, are, you know, serving those beneficiaries. One are these sort of tools and capabilities. We've talked about some of them. We are using the brain. We're talking about Rome. We're using discourse. You know, we're talking about Miro. Uh, there's a, and it gets kind of hard here, this calendaring, you know, we need like almost like a calendaring system where we all can see what are all of the meetings that are going on. And so there are these tools and capabilities. Capabilities could also be, you know, processes or practices, I mean, probably not, but but there, these are the things that we need to build technically, like as human beings have done and built tools. And then you have these guilds, the blue stuff down at the bottom here, these guilds and practices, and we're building these too, right? Story threading is one of them. We have graphic facilitation. You know, I talk about facilitation practice. There's learning how people learn. Pirate TV in some ways is a practice or, you know, so I don't know what the guild or practice system thinking and all of those things, if you take, if we start building out guilds and practices, right, we start building out tools and capabilities and we start building out domains of change, that the domains of change will actually inform, become like in, in terms of a design thinking standpoint, they are the ones that are informing what we need to do. So we're not just building stuff to build stuff, we're building stuff with change in mind. Um, and maybe I'll just finish by saying, each one of these, each one of these different things needs this, you know, kind of organizational, this piece here, organizational support and management. And I saw in discourse, the fact that we we're saying, well, what are the org structures and those things? Is it a multi, you know, multi-celled super organism made up of um, organizations? Do we need new legal structures? Do we need all that kind of stuff to hold, to hold and support, you know, this? Um, and each one of these three wedges has kind of its own mission, right? These domains of change, their mission is to grow membership and grow impact. You know, tools and capabilities are to make, make you know, the growing of membership and growing of impact easier and more efficient, um, right? And the guilds and practices are to create, you know, shared ways of doing, shared ways of thinking that enable all of those things to be done. So. I, I'm just starting to play around with this. And I think if we can collectively think holistically about all of this, but then get ourselves attached to where we have passion so that we can get more momentum and focus against all of these fronts, at, um, I think that will be um, quite beneficial for us. So that's my, uh, that's my check-in. That's where, that's where my mind is at. Um, if you want to keep the keep the graphic up on the screen for a second, I think uh, Kevin wanted to jump in, and I know I want to jump in. So Kevin, go ahead. Uh, you're muted. Yeah. Hey, you're not, you're this good. is. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You know the the crossing of domains is really interesting. I'm working, as I mentioned before, with a faith based economy in a lot of ways, and it turns out churches around the country own a lot of farmland that. It used to be a way to pay preachers to give them some land. And so I'm, I'm, I'm working with folks who want to look at the collective use of that. And what we're looking at is a purchasing cooperative, which is real easy to do because you don't have to have a lot of complex governance. You just can collectively lower your cost of seed and lower your cost of fertilizer and lower your cost of farm equipment. And we can figure out other things from there. Cooperatives often help you share in the abundance and then mutual things help you stop things you don't want. <clears throat> so we can look at mutual uh, crop insurance and flood insurance, but the easiest thing to do crossing the domains uh, with, for these folks is uh, a purchasing cooperative because it cuts their cost of operation and it doesn't cause them to have to change anything. So I'm looking for, for inflection points, you know, Dem Danella Meadows inflection points that cross those domains. So I really love the graphic, Matt, thanks. Love this. Um, let me jump in and then, and then Klaus. Um, so a thing that occurs to me, Matt, is that maybe this is a, a cross section through a triangular tube yes. that's, that's standing in the field and that what's pouring through the tube are projects. Yes. And some of those projects are open source, some of those projects are for profit. 
And as the project sort of, sort of goes through the tube, different guilds participate because they're needed for the project. Somebody's leading the project and goes, oh, we need some of you, some of you uh, come on over. Um, the project touches one or several domains. One of my fears is drawing domain boundaries too sharply. Correct. Because everything is deeply intertwingled. But the idea that there's a finance, money, value, wealth nexus is, is awesome. Uh, and, you know, soil, fertility, climate, earth nexus is, is awesome. And then they choose from the tools depending on what they need to get done and how they want to memorialize their work and share it out and all those kinds of things. So, so kind of the projects are bouncing down the tube, picking up from the different kinds of uh, communities and project and, uh, uh, and domains and, and tools. Yeah, um, I love this idea of like the project drives right dry you know domains i think the, the projects have to spin up from creating value right uh, and value not in terms of the classic capitalistic vision of value or um but cr you know producing change in the world that is of value and that those projects will dem will consume tools but they also will um, or will you know, again, that word consume, well, I'll have to, I'll have to work that out in my system. We'll draw on those tools, but it will also inform tool makers to make better tools. And I think, I think part of this is how do we get people who say, I want to be a tool maker and I'm going to be making tools to help those projects because those projects are based on problems that need to be solved in those domains of change. And I love the domains of change doing that. And the same thing with the guilds and the practices. How do those guilds and practices learn, constantly learn going back to, you know, um, you know, Scott, what you, you know, your quote, right, become the learning engine of how to do things so that those domains can focus on the problem sets at, at, you know, in a greater level of focus, right? Um, and, and I think this is where we can start to build some ownership and then still have this check-in where we're all primordial mixing it together and, and then that way, you know, Kevin, if your sense making process is very, you know, uh, you know, sit and contemplate, then we build tools that help that. And right. And if someone else's process is about really about uh, analytics and rigor and spreadsheets and that we build tools that support. So we build. And that was my comment on discourse was not was not about people helping me how to think better, but how do we enable everyone's thought process to inform the way that we build tools so that we're enabling every human being to think at their peak, peak performance against the problem sets that we need to solve because they're so damn big. And I think that's the other thing that I'm learning here is, you know, Mark has been working on climate change for however many years and is frustrated by the lack of progress. I'm sure Klaus, you've been working on food for however many years and probably frustrated by the lack of progress. We need to we need to almost bring in more people and bring this united in the same way that QAnon has ignited, you know, the conspiracy theorists into a powerful force. We need to, you know, bring the intellectual horsepower of, of change thinking um, into the world in a powerful force. So yeah. I know I'm on my soapbox. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Klaus. So, so with that, Matt, we, we are, um, I think, in exactly the same position where we found ourselves in this nonprofit group, in this NGO group. Right. We also listed uh, animal rights, vegetarian, vegans, uh, uh, list environmental concerns, pollution from CAFOs and so on. So when I look at food, uh, it's an umbrella that, that has to incorporate education and health and environment because it touches on all of those things. And if we can communicate that, you know, if we can come to me, the, the way I, I have put that into my mind is, and I'm also showing that in, in, in my PowerPoint presentations, I put food on par with energy. Oh, we know that the energy system uh, needs to be reformed, needs to be carbon neutral and all of that. But the, or the other system is food where we can uh, sequester carbon into the soil to buy ourselves time for the energy systems. And in order to do that, you know, we have to make so many changes uh, that also impact uh, health. Uh, we need to have the education to, under, to make people understand what food really is, that it is so much more than, than what you just eat. So, so the, the, uh, um, 
the, 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 what, what I'm missing in this, in this graphic here is the umbrella function, you know, that uh, where we have to have a commonality in, in where are we going? And this is this process of crystallizing. That's, that's, you know? that's, that's this thing, Klaus. And I think I, I agree that there needs to be an umbrella system. And remember the model that I showed the other day where it used to be a line in and a, a square and then decision-making and execute. And then that moved yep. to all of these rays opening up of all this information pouring in and that this thing that instead of being one triangle, it was you know one rhombus, it was sort of spinning over. And so it kind of created. We, it, Can you show us what you're pointing to then, Matt? Um, I, um, I don't it's know. It's a different I graphic. Have, I, I don't know if I have that document, but um, it was. Um, um, uh, it was a graphic that had uh, a line coming in, a big circle, which was a square rotated or a, a hexagon yes. rotated. So it and went then, from and a bunch of went, rays coming out. It yeah. went from this is the normal way that businesses think, that people think, that we've been all taught to think, that you, anal you bring in information and you analyze it. You sort of work within a framework, right? That expands within that framework, converges within that framework, and then you come up with execution. And, you know, this is the kind of model where I say, okay, I believe that it's only about food is my center framework. My mental model is a mental model of food. Somebody else says, no, my mental model, my mental model is a mental model of, you know, energy. No, my mental model is, a, you know, is an, a mental model of, of money, right? And, and so, so the idea is how do you spin all of these mental models together and work them together? And I think, you know, inter, inter, um, Hank can share it, um, but interdisciplinary, um, interdisciplinary thinking, right? What part of the problem with um, academic, you know, academies right now, and I've been talking to people and just play the video, um, is that interdisciplinary thinking, they, they, everyone likes their own discipline, right? They fall in love with their own mental models, right? This is what human beings and do. And I think what we can, Klaus, to your point, is the food system is a way into the, to the, the, to the whole system right? Energy system is a way into the whole system. And so this sense making has to be all of those systems and all of the information about those systems coming together. But I don't think any one person can, can comprehend that. And so we need, you know, we need, um, you know, Peter Van, you know, the work that you're doing with creatives and artists to be in here. We need the work that we're doing with, um, you know, food to be in here, with education to be in here. And, and in some ways we have to, OGM is about allowing all of those perspectives to come together and work together, right? Sorry. No, don't be sorry. That's great. Um, yep. And if you can unshare so we can see everybody, uh, Neil. You moved my mute button. I found it. Matt, love that. Thank you for sharing that because it shows the bit that I could see that was missing. And I think Klaus mentioned was that umbrella sense making. Just be aware some people can actually make greater sense of greater complexity than others. Correct. And this, this is a vertical hierarchy, right? It's not a hierarchy of, of control. It's a hierarchy of consciousness, right? And it's not to go to the spiritual, but it's to say, if I deeply connect with these multiple sources, I can see this pattern. If you can't see it, and you as a designer, anybody as a graphic designer, anybody as an architect, can do these things differently to others. Others can follow once they can see the artifact that's coming from that. And the whole systems design process requires multiple sense-making inputs and a vision that shows this is the sort of thing we could create and followers who are prepared to do the nitty gritty down to earth work yeah. and support for those that can do the visionary work who are generally doing it for nothing all the time forever, right? And so, the problem we've got is that the transformative thinkers are not being supported by the people that want to do the work and the people that have the resources to do the work don't necessarily let in the transformative thinkers. I think this is where Hank was agreeing with me last week on, uh, yes, I, I, that's my story, right? So how do we line up this uh, mutually assistive community of different levels of thinking and different ways of seeing in ways that allows those that can provide a vision which is more holistic, to weave in the pieces of evidence required to convince those that would otherwise not be able to be entrained in the process because they're still fighting over difference. 
And so the, the thing is, you've got to find a mechanism for governance of unlike minds, not of like minds. And that's the story that I've been trying to explore in the big questions thing that I put on, uh, I'm not sure if it's discourse, discord, wherever it's gone, I'm on two 15 platforms at the moment. But mm -hmm. in, in, your, in, in your platform, I've tried to explore that. But the meta constitutional processes for how we define the rules by which we each agree the rules within which we then decide the priorities within which we then decide how to apply the knowledge is what's lacking because that's the whole system's transformative thinking bit into which all these pieces form. But it does require the overarching systems ethical question for what purpose and in what systems context? Because if we aren't doing what we ought to do, then we're screwed. So what ought we be teaching in schools? What skills ought we be building? If we know these things are happening, how do we do it in a different way? So I, I'll, I'll pass it to Klaus in a second, but I, I, and I don't know how to express this properly. I don't, I don't believe that there is a curriculum that everybody should learn in schools. Like the common core makes me crazy. <clears throat> I, I think that, that like, this is what everybody should know how to do. Doesn't work for me. No, no, I didn't mean that. I, I, but, I, but I heard a bit of that. And, and, and I think other people who really think like we need a lot of structure totally heard that. It's like, awesome. So glad Neil said that. And so what I'm trying to figure out is, and, and, and there are many communities that are way further ahead than us on how to fix the world. Uh, and, and, and part of what I want to do is build bridges to them. And what I'm looking for is how can we be useful to all of them so that the best of what they're figuring out kind of absorbs into us and we then modify our structures to improve how we work according to the best of their principles, rules, uh, artifacts, uh, whatever else it might be, how do we influence them by helping them create a better memory and share what, they, what they've discovered better out, uh, et, et cetera. And how does all of this turn into an ethos, a way of seeing, a way of being, a way of doing? And I own the domain CB do because Marty Spiegelman and I years ago were talking about, you know, once you see differently, you can sort of be differently, then you act differently. But get, getting to that is a kind of congruence. It's not a here's the best model of all the models. That doesn't work, I think, either, because then what you get into is religious combat and other sorts of things. But how do, how do we get this ethos of making progress on the right things together? Because like you said, if we work on the wrong things, we're screwed. <clears throat> but without somehow having a strong, solid umbrella that says this is right, because that generally leads to combat. And, and I'm not saying this well, I'm, I'm, I'm overstating a lot of it, but, <clears throat> but that's kind of where that took me. So uh, if I can just do a very, very quick uh, follow-up, because I think there was a confusion there. Okay. The work I was doing in, in, in Australia was with real communities and in looking at how to develop a United Nations regional centre of expertise for education for sustainability for the whole of the Murray-Darling Basin. The challenge is that the universities are training nurses and doctors to go to the cities. They're not training people that are going to actually be able to maintain communities in the midst of climate change and now COVID and social and eco ecological collapse. So when I talk, what ought we be teaching? It's not a one size fits all curriculum. It's tailored to system boundaries. It's based on how we have made sense of the trends and directions as Klaus is saying about food collapse and various other things and how do we support each other. But the fundamental things we ought to be learning are system ethics and how we relate not just topics of mathematics or STEM or whatever, right? And there's no point in training more nurses for a city that's collapsed. And there's no point in training more lawyers to compete if you've got nobody to work the land and feed them, right? And so how do we get to that higher level, system ethical, whole system intent? That's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Klaus, Julian, Kevin. So, so this is where this concept leading from the emerging future is coming from. So we were at the, the Gene Scope, uh, you know, when we were working on this Kumu project, we got invited by uh, the University of Cambridge to participate in this future thinking uh, uh, concept. And it's very interesting they actually developed a software to guide this as an exercise. Um, so we would have uh, a cycle and then uh, the, there were moderators who picked uh, certain comments and brought it to the next level. But in a, in a nutshell, the idea is that we were in 2050 and we defined what the world looks like in 2050 and then we're going to 2020 and we determined what had to take place, what took place in 2020, 2025, 2030 to get us to this 2050 space. So we, we, we have, when, when we have a clear 
picture of the destination, not something like clearly defined or structured or so on, but uh, a, an idealized version of the future in our minds, then our minds will screen phenomena, people, ideas in a different way. So, so for example, I put on uh, a group of people that just formed a, a nonprofit company, which I thought was just amazing. Uh, uh, how how spot on what they are doing is to the needs of the economy currently. And the way I see this is because I have a clear vision of where we need to go with the food system in order to put out to put this thing back together. So I think you start in the future and then then your thinking today gets gets moved and enlightened towards towards that. Uh, Julian, Kevin, Matt. And Julian, we can't hear you. And Julian, I don't see you. Shoot, maybe he dropped off. Um, okay, uh, Kevin, then Matt. Yeah, <clears throat> just really quickly, when you think about doing things, um, I love all the creators in the room and no project ever really becomes real and no business becomes real until you have line workers who do the boring work that the creatives hate. Um, so it's just, you know, uh, creatives are good. They have marginal utility when you do things. They need to be siloed away from the actual, you know, production line when it's time to do things because they will want to tweak something that should be a repetitive process. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, the creator's value has, has, has value at a certain point in time and less value at other points in time. That's my perspective. And in brainstorming what OGM could turn into, Matt and Hamilton and Hank and I were, were thinking that there's a really important role we call builders, and that builders are people who love to make shit happen and don't necessarily have a particular tool they care about or a, or a domain that, 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 that's really hot for them. They just want to you know, help, help propel change uh, by doing what you just said, Kevin. So I, I think we need to make a, a role for that. And also, uh, one of the things that <clears throat> I was thinking about the diagram that Matt shared is, um, as people show up to OGM, the, a map like that can help them find their way to where they can add their energy. That's part of the structure that we need is, is like, hey, I'm new here. What, what, you know, what's up and where, where can I help? How can I help? And, and you know, more clarity around domains, roles, guilds, tools, whatever, and projects, I think will, will, will give us that. My two businesses that went big, it turned out that I found myself uh, one floor below the main operation at, at the Southwest and a Feng Shui person said, that's exactly where he needs to be when it turns into scale. He just comes up and stirs shit up, but he doesn't get in the way. Awesome, that's great. Uh, Matt then Charles. I didn't know if Mark raised his hand as well, so, um, or if uh, I just saw that. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that I'm, you know, I want to see if we can do as a group and challenge us as a group is um, to put the right scaffolding in place for the conversations that we're having to not, not just get lost, um, you know, and, you know, Judy, you were talking about the dendrites and, and making sure we're following those things. And, and so, you know, Neil, well, I don't disagree with anything that you were saying. And Klaus, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. Those, those conversations that you were having are in the system change kind of place, right? Those are conversations that belong in, you know, domains of, you know, changing the way that we think about education or changing the way we think about the food system or changing the way we think about the energy system related to the food system, related to the money system. Like, like we need to facilitate those conversations. We also need to draw in, as Jerry was saying, draw in all the other people who are also in those conversations because I, 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 I think critical mass here is really important. Momentum here is important and, you know, momentum in the human context is mass times, you know, velocity, right? So let's take, velo you know, or in the, in the physical, is physics sense is mass times velocity. Let's take velocity and mass in the human sense. Mass has to do with density and the number of people. So higher level people in an organization have greater level of density in themselves. But if you have, you know, millions of people, you know, together, 
that creates its own kind of mass. And then you have to get that mass moving in, with, with <clears throat> speed in a given direction. And Klaus, your problem set is that everyone's directions are going like this, even though they're in the same room and those vectors aren't aligned. And so I think part of the work of the, these domains is about you know, g gaining more mass and then getting that mass in an aligned direction so that they can have real impact on the frictions that exist in our world today. There are so many frictions about because we're all used to our own lives, we're used to our air conditioning, we're used to our, you know, our buildings, our clothes, whatever it is. And, and until we get enough momentum against that, we're not, we're not gonna be able to move. So I, I, want, I want some people, I would love to see some of us say, I am intentionally focused on that, those, those ambitions within that construct. And then other people to say, okay, I'm intensely focused on building things, you know, building the tools and the capabilities for those people so that they can do their work better. And other people are saying, well, I want to deal with the skills and capabilities, whether it's storytelling, story threading, you know, systems thinking that can, can supply those people having that impact with whatever they need from those capabilities to, to facilitate that change in, in the world. And I, I think the more organized we get, to Jerry's point, the more when people come in, we can say, hey, where do you want to play? I want to play here. Great. Because I think focusing our energies and efforts, at this point in time, we're kind of out of the, you know, we, we like each other. We like the way each other thinks. We all believe in each other's passion. We now need to get this stuff, uh, you know, some traction moving. And I, I think we can do it. Um, it just requires a little organization, right? Um, um, a couple things. Uh, I, I think that people are showing up and saying, I'm really intensely interested in this as Klaus is, right? Yes. You know, and so forth. And the rest of us are like, what is this? How does it fit? Where is it going? Um, and I'm trying to figure out what is the right, what is the right analogy? What is the right metaphor? What is the right word or process for, like, it's not engulf and devour. <clears throat> it's not how viruses hijack other organisms. It's basically, how do we kind of resonate with other organizations whose thinking we really like and meld with them. It's maybe it's a Vulcan mind meld. It's, it's, a, it's an organizational Vulcan mind meld. And I have a hunch that Neil knows a lot about this. Um, and I'll pause for a second and I've also got a small cue. Uh, Neil, then I'll uh, go back to the cue. Just very quickly. Um, consciousness is around include and transcend. But with entrepreneurship, it's about it transcend to then include, right? The strange attractor is what is cast in front of the crowd that was otherwise going a different direction. And it's the thing which potentially with sufficient inertia becomes the new model that makes the old one obsolete. So you need both and, and you need to play these roles, uh, zoom in, zoom out, play these roles, sense into which way is the herd moving. Matt's exactly correct. I use uh, the um, water buffalo and the, and the wildebeest on the Serengeti as an example, right? That if the herd isn't moving, you can't steer them. <laughs> and so where are they going to go? Well, they're going to go towards the grass. Where's the grass? Well, there's the lightning. And two, two weeks from now, the grass will be there. So we better start moving, right? So there's a visionary direction. There's also a whole bunch of risks you've got to take into account along the way. Once they're moving, you can steer them, right? But you're still aiming broadly for the same sort of direction. But you don't have to have an absolute vision. You don't have to have an absolute crystallized, perfect model. And my point is that every town is potentially a systems model, provided they co-constitute around what it is they need to know to survive and be there in 50 years time. Um, so I have a little cue of Mark Charles and Judy. Okay, the um, Carla O'Dell's quote that I use all the time, if only we knew what we know, has really influenced how I think about this stuff. And I thought it might be useful just to show a couple of things that are very pertinent to some of the conversations that we have, mm -hmm. um, uh, been having. So just for example, the Klaus mentioned the idea of pre-mortems and, and there's actually an interesting literature on this idea of, you know, storytelling in the future about what happened in the past and how effective uh, it can be as, as a way of communicating things. And uh, Richard Thaler, uh, Nobel Prize winning behavioral economist, um, you know, said it put into the edge question in 2017 that he thought pre-mortems was sort of the, the most important tool that we are not using enough when we're talking about 
um, all sorts of problems that we're trying to solve. And so I just wanted to throw out there because throw that out there because there there is a lot of information out there on that. Uh, on a related note, you know, this issue of of in the food system, you've got the vegans and you've got everything else. You know, in the climate change area, it's it's much worse. And and yes, it's hard to get all these people talking to each other, but there's a whole different side of the problem. And, and that comes about, you know, in, in climate change, I use the, the, the metaphor of chess, so climate chess. And one of the things that we don't think about is that as we pull more people onto our team, let's say the team urgency, um, and in this case, you know, for example, the alternative economic models, alternative political models, you know, the idea that we have to get rid of capitalism to solve climate change. And I'm not arguing with that point. All I'm saying is when we pull the anti-capitalism forces into team urgency, a whole new army marches onto the field for team no urgency because they're scared to death of the idea of getting rid of capitalism. And so it, it adds a whole different complexity to who do you want to bring to the table and who do you want to engage in terms of what new oppositional barriers are you going to throw up just because those people are now part of the conversation. Uh, two very last points. Klaus also mentioned the, um, uh, you know, the, the food system shock. There's, it, it's interesting because the, the food system area and the potential climate change implications of food shocks is, is probably the most advanced systemic risk conversation in the climate change space. There's a lot of literature out there on it. it the, we've been talking about the topic for, about a decade, and uh, and and so it, there's there's a lot out there that we could do more with. Um, last something Ed pointed out on on fire, you know, it's it's worth remembering that in a 2010 uh, National Academies report, um, the they came up with this particular graphic, which I've used with uh, uh, decision makers, and this this graphic has been incredibly effective. This graphic is for the Western US, the area that you would expect to see annually burn <clears throat> per one degree centigrade, and which is what we're, we're at in the Western US. And it ranges everywhere from about 70% for some ecosystems to 700% for other ecosystems. And, and that's what we're seeing play out in California right now. And with 80% of the houses being built in uh, the urban wildland interface, this is no surprise at all. And we, we, we anticipated this, you know, a decade ago. Uh, so I just wanted to throw out some stuff because there is so much out there that supplements some of the different conversations um, that, <clears throat> that we're having. And let me stop there. Um, Mark, that was, that was lightning speed and brilliant. And I was like, there, was, there were many, many wonderful things there. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Um, including sort of who do we bring in at what stage because it totally changes the conversation, which is which strange attractor do we put in front of the crowd, which is, you know, connected to everything we're talking about. Uh, so Charles, then Judy. Uh, thanks. I, I sort of um, had my hand up back when we were talking about roles and guilds and I got the, the flow sort of swept me off or you guys off. Um, but just another plug for the flow show and that we're going to really zoom in in a kind of hopefully acupunctural, tight, tightish sequence way on the roles and the guilds. Um, also Jerry and some others here um, are gonna be there and or are for sure invited, um, you know who you are. And anyone just DM me or email for, for the details. Um, I did put them way up in, in the chat here. Um, and and in, in terms of the sequence, the, the flow sequence during the biz flow segment, which is, a, um, 10 p.m. Central Europe, 1, p 1 p.m. in California. Um, that's the coming out of the hash bins and looking at the role flow and guild flow, then also kind of getting into the tech flow and sense flow and for sure the repo flow repository. Um, and that leads right into the story flow um, at the next hour, 2 p.m. Pacific in the story room. So Kiko Lab flow show, everyone's invited back on the roles and the guilds. Charles, can I just, I, I, I want to just say that I understand some of the things that you're saying right now, but there's some of the things that are just, you're using pattern language that doesn't, that, that I haven't learned yet. So 
when you talk about the flow shows, are these, what, what are these things? How do you categorize them as a, is it a capability? Is it a, you know, is it a, is it a mechanism? What, it's, a, what? it's, it's actually, a, it's actually a radio show, but it's on Zoom. <laughs> it's a show. Um, it's a show. So it's right? a show that just launched on Monday and for the next three Mondays. And you're going to be, you're going to be, sh you're, we're going to be publishing information, right? Out. Well, we're recording and we do um, unlisted on Zoom with the video, but then everything goes uh, through our workflow process in the repository. Yeah. And so I, I think, you know, to put this in the context of, of kind of the bigger conversation that we were having, you know, to me, this is precisely like one of those practices or capabilities, right? That, that if we build up the flow shows and they get traction in the world, now that's a channel for which we can start to communicate certain things and to align and mobilize. And I think for us to, for us to create a mental map of what are all of these projects and activities and where do they fit in our system? The system is a, basically a system of change that is inclusive of lots of different, you know, kind of uh, thought processes. I think that would help us and, you know, help us understand what everybody's not only is doing, but where it fits and how, where do we want to supercharge or boost things? Then we know where we're getting traction and where we're not getting traction. We start to divert our energies and stuff toward those, you know, toward those things. But we don't yet have a map of activity yet. Um, and as Ann Pendleton would say in Hamilton, like we don't quite, we haven't quite defined our systems of action. Um, and I think we need, we, we may need multiple maps of, of that territory. So Absolutely. That we can find Absolutely. our way to it. Charles For sure. And, just to quickly, quickly, quickly respond. Thank you, Matt. I, I'm really um, excited to pursue that further and you're for sure invited. I, I emailed you as well. Um, uh, just just a, a quick word on the context, which I didn't mention, but so this is, um, and I do have my maps, of, of course, as well. The, um, the, the concept with Kiko Lab, and, and maybe this has some, some relevance resonance with, with OGM, I, ho I hope, I think, but we didn't articulate that. It's a P2P incubator idea, a P2P incubator accelerator, you know, and what does that really mean? And we, we can't really know until we come together, you know, and talk about it and, and decide and figure it out together. Um, so that's um, with, within the biz flow part of the flow show at large. So, cool. Thanks. And it's and it's on my to do list to have a conversation with you and Lauren about how these things might align and what we might how we might better structure Kiko Lab yeah. plus OGM. I had um, a wonderful call with with Pete Kaminsky yesterday about that too. Yeah, awesome. That happens a lot with Pete. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, Judy, thank you for um, uh, you're muted and thank you for your patience. Please jump in. I doesn't say I'm muted on my machine. You're good. You're good now. You just okay. unmuted. Um, I guess the thing that I'm focusing on, I'm I'm really wanting action vectors, in in a, a major complement, maybe even dwarfing to some extent knowledge vectors, because we're facing many multiple crises, and so it would be interesting from my perspective to try to actualize all of these dimensions and start mapping action plans that are dendritic instead of content that builds and connects to other content. And that would put a whole different spin. It would be like another zone of your brain because it would, you know, you could take action vectors on anything in the brain, but I want to extract the action vectors to be able to look at what I can do in the arts organization that connects with the science organization that connects with the university and how I form those connections to get some momentum going that's not pursuing a linear path to a future that may have no relevance. Thank you. Um, I, I agree. And part of what the goal of this call was, which we're, we've gone 90 minutes, so we should start wrapping, was to define some guilds, for example, and some domains uh, more for the guilds, so that the guilds could actually start forming up so that they could take action on whatever it is that whatever the practices are that they'd like to do. So let, let's bounce uh, that topic to next week's call and maybe before. Uh, I, I also wanted to add a little something, then I'll pass it to Neil. Um, and this is just about change. And I think one of our domains is just is change, like how change works, how to catalyze change, uh, how, what, what causes people to change. But I'm really struck that 
I have a, a desk at a little uh, design firm here in, in Portland called Ziba. And every Monday I run a little think thing over lunch where we sit down and just talk about stuff. And one Monday uh, I was like, hey, there seems to be a lot of activity around this virus coming. <clears throat> and our conclusion at the end of that conversation was, maybe we should ask everybody to take their laptops home because we don't know what might happen the next day. The next week, there wasn't one of these lunch meetings because shutdown, lockdown happened in between thinking, may, in between thinking maybe we should take our laptops home, but business as usual and lockdown. And, and, and so that, that has really stuck in my head because it was inconceivable to us that, that all of the businesses of Portland, never mind most of the world, would actually be in lockdown. And that is the week that it happened in the US and it had happened earlier in China. And it just wasn't close enough to us that we noticed, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the dramatic pace of change sometimes really sort of whacks me, but also the impossibility of conceiving that future. And, and cause I, I love sort of uh, future histories and backcasting and a whole bunch of other kinds of means of, of trying to see what's going, going to go on, but we seldom can even, even want to envision the future that actually happens. Uh, and here I'll go back to slavery, which is most, most colonists in the early, in the early states um, couldn't envision the American economy without slavery. It just was impossible for them to picture that the economy would even work unless there were people who were working for free under, you know, subjugated uh, in, that, in that way. It was just a natural part of everything. The way you knew who the richest people were in the country was the people who owned the most humans. That, that was like, it wasn't that, you know, Bill Gates has $60 billion. It was so-and-so has 2,200 slaves and that therefore is the wealthiest person. So, so I think that part of our charter is to play with tools and to play with these methods and so forth so that we can arrive at means to have these conversations with people uh, in a way that, 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 that works so that we can change um, the way we all work together for the better in some way. And that sounds really vague in general, but, but even like saying something is better than something else is sort of gotta find our way to that. And I've been watching the RNC every night um, with a drink in hand, <clears throat> and it's been really, really hard because I feel like I'm looking at the negative of a film. I feel like I'm looking at counterfactuals every day, all the time, 24 seven. I'm calling this the gaslighting convention <clears throat> because apparently um, Donald Trump is more of a mensch than Joe Biden and has, and has gone to more graduations and shaken more people's hands and welcomed more troops back than Joe, who's never done a thing in his life. And I'm like, the, this is just bright and loud and clear an urgent need for what it is we're working on here in the realm of politics today. Because there's less than 70 days, I've forgotten what the count is to where we're going, but, but you know, um, we, are, we are on an imminent brink of, of, a, of a decision that scares me right now because it's smelling awfully close to what the 2016 scenario looked like. Anyway, sorry for the long rant, but, but my nerves are a little on edge because I've been watching the, the convention and trying to sit and absorb it in a way that is useful for our conversations here uh, because I think the work we're doing really matters to that conversation also. And I think one of our domains is politics, governance, and change and, 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 and how this change happens. So uh, enough on that. Neil, and you may end up having the, the last word on today's call. Just, uh, am I able to show, share screens there, um, Jerry? Uh, and go just, ahead. Yeah, uh, just, while, just while I'm mentioning that, the reason I'm in Belgium is because I saw this coming, right? Not uh, COVID, but collapse. And my partner and I said, you better get over here now. This is going to, hit, the shit's going to hit the fan. We've been sensing this. Some of us have been doing this for 20 years, right? So we know this is coming. None of us here can pretend that we don't know climate collapse is coming. It's a question of when we choose to act, right? Um, in terms of sharing screen, let me just share the, uh, see if I can work out where it went. Do you have permission to share the screen? Hank, we need to give you that. Yeah. Yeah, you're good. <clears throat> is it coming up? Yes. Um, right, now that I can find out where it went. <laughs> hmm. uh, forgive me, lost it. Go down, find, power, find PowerPoint, come back up. Yeah, sorry, trying to get back to PowerPoint. Yep. Where are we? Can you see it? Why can't yes, we see it just fine. Oh, I can't. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> How do I make you smaller? Um, zoom. All right, okay. Now, why won't... Can you see it large or... Uh, it's small. It's, it, we, there we, we can't go. Read there we go. Now it's no, perfect. That's better. Much better. Just, just showing a, a construct here which might help with some of the conversations that's been happening around guilds and things. Um, I think it was Kevin mentioned about need, you need doers 
right? And we need action on the ground. And for those things which we can agree and of which we're certain, they're simple, we can plan, we can control them, right? For those things that are technically complicated, we're less certain, we need expertise. For those things which are socially complicated, we need to build relationships and build common ground. And for those things that are truly complex, we need a very, very different set of skills, right? And so this is a construct that I did after conversations with a variety of people, as you can see at the bottom. And it was talking about for managing projects and sites, this is around regeneration, but complexity. So for projects and sites, constructing, growing, harvesting, maintaining assets, we know how to do that. Building trust and organizing trustworthy teams, we know how to do that. Procuring regenerative community sites, enlisting heads, hearts, hands, engaging, facilitating. This is socially complicated work because you're, you're dealing with people of unlike mind. I'll just slide you guys across to here. On this side, understanding the site potentials, for example, in master planning or, or farming or technology, right, as a technical skill. When you start to come out into this zone of complexity, though, you're now looking at integrative, anticipatory whole system design of linked social ecological systems. How is this place going to survive in the future? When you start to explore those landscapes of potentials, the human ecological and ecosystemic, and you're looking to catalyze social ecological entrepreneurship and synthesize systemic needs to coherently align across time, space, relationships and change, right? The issue at the top is you've got individual consciousness and education can raise that or you can go on your own journey. Collective consciousness like this group here, raising the realizations for deep, deeper potentials. But there's also another role way out here, which is holding spaces and the system safe for the system to see and sense itself in deepening and widening through collective presencing which is beyond what uh, Klaus was talking about, but the same model of theory U, collective presencing at the bottom of the U towards targeted system health interventions, grief working, etc. So that's just one example of the sort of thing. Now, I think there's a structure here for the sort of stuff that's probably in the global brain, right? In terms of what's the simple stuff we know how to do? What's the mm -hmm. harder stuff? What are the skills? And I think there are guilds in, in these maps as well. Now, not necessarily this one, but who are the people that can communicate at this level? to do this sort of thing in this context. And if we can work out how to bring people together to do that in places and give them the information to do the work, then we will have transcended the old model with the intention of coming back to include them. And that's an ethical intention to go further, faster, take the risk to try and find a way forward, knowing that the current system is going to fail and is failing. I'll stop there, thanks. Um, Neil, that is awesome. That is, that, that is a whole call worth of, uh, and much more uh, worth of thinking. I appreciate it. Uh, my, my thought here is um, my, my, my model of change at its simplest is the three things I sort of typed into the chat, which is um, figure out how to give people simple goals like <laughs> soil health, right? Like, like uh, a simple goal is, hey, if you mine the soil, a bunch of other stuff about the system gets better. Right and and here and, and different for social systems, different for everything. But how do you how do you crystallize things down so that everybody doesn't have to have a, a map of the entire working system in their heads because that ain't going to happen. So how do we make it so that people have simple guidelines? Um, the, uh, the change model that is my favorite change model is taking people by the hand to try something new. Some somebody who trusts you, taking you into some new experience. And my story is, a buddy took me to my first Quaker meeting way back when I lived in Connecticut, and I fell in love with Quakerism because a buddy of mine said, "Hey, why don't you meet me and in, in fam, uh, you know, at, at this building?" And I got there before they did. Uh, and then modeling behavior is incredibly important. So the more and, and Chico Lab is trying to do this with, you know, the, the Cool Lab and so forth is like, how do, how do we actually instantiate something that other people can can go? Oh, I'll have what they're having. Like that line from when Harry met Sally is one of my favorite lines because to me that's a, a, one of the big catalysts of, of social change is seeing that other people are doing this kind of weird new thing, but they're succeeding and they're having a great time. And I want to I wanna do that because the ground I'm standing on seems really flimsy and shaky and is getting worse and worse. But, but almost nobody will cross the river on their own because it looks really dangerous and deadly. So they, and, and they can't imagine the grassy field on the other side because that's really hard. Sorry, that was just, just riffing on your diagram. So I'm wondering where those concepts of things like modeling behavior fit into the diagram, you know, if they would uh, like that. Uh, and I, I saw Klaus and I think Judy raised their hands and Matt. 
Yeah, I Charles. think we have to take it for granted that systems have a tendency to sub-optimize. So following Peter Trucker here, systems automatically sub-optimize. So this is, our, this is the experience we just had in this NGO world, you know, animal rights and veganism and all of these things. And so to provide context within the system so it can harmonize its intentions, that brings power to the system. But we have to assume from uh, going in, even within our own discussions here, that there will always be a tendency to suboptimize. And I think one reason they get suboptimized is that they get captured. And once they're captured, they get locked into some way that benefits a few people, uh, you know, to, to, to go on from there, a longer conversation. So let's go uh, to Judy, then Matt, then Charles. And Judy just stepped away. Uh, so Matt and Charles, and we'll, we'll get Judy when she comes back. Yeah, I, I agree that um, systems naturally sort of, it's, it's this notion of um, entropy, right? Like if you look at the long history of time and someone did this project out of Australia, I wish I could remember his name where he tracked time from the very beginning of everything through, through now. And, you know, entropy brings everything down, right? That's a system in some ways sub-optimizing. And then you have these threshold moments that elevate into, you know, those other, into that other state. Usually that comes from, you know, a kind of a form of catharsis, which is, um, you know, systems change for two reasons. Catharsis, which is the complete breakdown of, and then the emergence of something else, right? If you think about human catharsis or enlightenment, which is some level of awareness that um, you achieve and then elevate to, you know, that, that, that higher state. And I think, you know, that's the role of facilitation in, in systems is it to make it easy or easier for that system to achieve balance. Right, because I don't know if they sub-optimize. I think, to Jerry's point, they become out of balance. Something wins and dominates, and then consolidates the power and makes it, you know, ultimately, um, a, a, basically destroys the system because of its own, you know, own thing. So, uh, the play, the sorry, what I really wanted to come to though is, again, back to this idea of organization and where does action happen. Right. If action is happening and projects are happening out of these domains and domains job is to find points of intervention and to work together to find these points of intervention in the meta system that help it to keep moving forward and guilds actually work across any type of intervention type. So if you, and we need to, we, this is why I want language to separate that we don't use guilds to mean everything. Right. I think a guild is a skill or a practice or a, or, or, or a way of doing that can be applied against any action, any project that fits within domains of understanding that all have to ultimately be brought together into this complex system awareness that um, you know, Neil was talking about. And then the tools and the builders, those are to enable those guilds and those you know, places of action to do, to do what they do best. And we're building things in service of. And I think if we do that and we build, you know, we build all of that capability and we show, demonstrate to model a new way of working, that's when you start to draw, I, you know, I feel like I could start to draw some of people in the business community into this, right? Kevin and I are trying to do this right now with, you know, a big fidelity investments and drawing them into some of these change, you know, things that Kevin's been thinking about with these community banks. So I think we have, to, we have to build these models and then we have to go and distribute them to people who have the power to actually move in this direction. And I think talking about systemic risk and all of that kind of stuff and helping them see these things is the way that we're gonna do it. Um, and so that's my kind of, again, I'm coming back to the same system of action that, um, you know, and the question is, is can we start next time, next conversation, maybe not with the check-in, but with just getting this conversation going? Because I feel like we run out of time and we add more material, and now we have to use the material that we already have and just start, you know, getting the thing organized. So things, get, things just get juicy when our calls get long. It's very weird. Yeah. And it's lovely, but uh, yeah. Uh, so Judy, Charles, and then closing poem. Okay. I just want to bring us back, and I don't want to sound like a broken record. But we aren't doing, in my mind, a very good job of gathering the action points that are possible inflections. And if we can identify action steps 
that can be influenced in some way and we attempt to influence them in multiple locations, then we have an opportunity to learn what works and what doesn't work. So somehow we need a process to experiment, report, and modify in an experiential learning kind of model so that we do things and then we fine tune them and then we fine tune them better and then we change them completely because the world just changed, but they still apply. And that's the way creative iteration kind of goes. And I think if we could focus on some of those aspects and how we can collect and enable those aspects, then maybe we can be better agents of change, which is I think what all of us are at heart wanting to do in service of a better world, better community. Sorry, thank you, Judy, that's right on. Um, Charles and then uh, Neil with a closing poem because we should uh, end our call. Um, back on the, the theme of system collapse and um, uncertainty. So there's a, I wanted to, to flash on um, a new project involving Tom Attlee. Um, he's, he's not driving it, he's an advisor, um, along with Martin Rausch, who, who made the, um, it was his, Martin's idea to do the pattern language out of uh, wise democracy work and uh, made the website. And um, so Martin and a guy called Michael Dowd, who I haven't really checked out, but he's an evolutionary evangelist, who, uh, I'm wondering if he might be in your brain, Jerry, but, um, and so uh, it's basically around uh, deep, deep adaptation, but um, more particularly like wise adaptation, or this, this kind of concept. Um, and it's feeding out of the wise democracy patterns. Um, Is this a right lens? Uh, could be. I, I honestly I didn't. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I think so. Okay. I think so. But. Um, um, yeah, just just to mention, so wise, it's kind of combining uh, several models, f feeding the wise democracy um, work into the transition design or through the lens of transition design ecosystem of collective sense making, which I've mentioned a bit, and I think there's still um, it's still ripe to kind of go into the forum for OGM, for example, and um, again, it's a new pattern line which actually around this uh, wise adaptation. So just uh, stay tuned for that. Awesome, um, thank you. That got me started on a whole bunch of stuff. Um, Neil, why don't we take a, everybody take a breath and uh, let Neil. Thanks, I'll just close question. the door because we've just chosen exactly the moment that the bells are tolling just a second. <laughs> and they're tolling for us. <laughs> this gives us that moment to take a breath. Oh, nice to have the bells tolling, actually. Yeah, I do. It uh, seems somehow we have bells over here. They were on somehow, time somehow seems appropriate, doesn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> we were just having that conversation. Yeah. Um, it's funny that um, uh, Charles should mention Michael Dowd because Michael Dowd has interviewed Jim Bandel uh, from Deep Adaptation. And Michael Dowd has a wonderful series on post doom, you know, except and then now what? Right, which is very much where the business of Anne and myself is coming from, and now what? Now that you know, now what? And a, an article by Jem Bandel and Gail Bradbrook in July uh, came out, and it prompted me to finalise a poem that I started writing during the fires in Australia last year. So I'll start with a quote from them, and then I'll go into the poem, and it's in solidarity with all of those uh, feeling uh, this pain and feeling what's happening in California and will happen in many other places. So it starts with, quote, our hurt is not something to suppress or seek a distraction from. Our tears can be a truth that we can integrate into our being. Then we can be honest with each other about the path ahead because it's a path of both despair and dedication, paying attention fully to what is around us and in front of us, even though it hurts, is to be fully alive. As Khalil Gibran wrote, the deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. There is a calling we're hearing to witness the beauty of life on earth, even as so much is being lost, in the same way we would tend the bedside of a dying loved one. And my poem is called No Ripples, and it was written uh, in an, on an evening in a rainforest pool that was shrinking in, in Australia, as the fires were uh, starting to rage through the southern part of the country and moving our way. No ripples. 
immersed, disembodied head above the surface, sunken body motionless, despite the nips of countless fish come to taste this large human sacrifice laid out in their shrinking sacred waters as the burning sun dipped behind Mount Allen. I felt the heat of the day, of the whole unrelentingly drying and frying week draining from me as the waters cooled seeped in, in this, the deepest spot, beside the long green wall of waterweed rising vertically, providing cover for the shy Mary River turtles who seek solace here and whose endangered nose tips I've seen breathing at this fluid juncture between the rocky bottom and the cool, clear water. No ripples, I tell myself mindfully. A self-imposed discipline in this wild and sacred place as agile wallabies approach, first one and then two. Cautious, alert, gray ears pricking at any sound from the forest. My face level with theirs as they look toward me. Large rear haunches up as they lean their pretty faces down and drink. Drink from the shallowing pool edge where more water weeds are stranded daily by the falling water level and each circumference shrinking sip. Long, slow, deep drafts to slake their thirst. Finally, after patiently filling, they rose, looked around, licked their paws, and bounded off into the crisp, dry, fallen leaves of the creek bed, leaving me immersed in air and water and the liminal darkening time zone between, where water beetles dodged each other like precision sports car team and long-legged water boatmen dented the water, walking on inverted clouds and rainforest reflections, bending the fading light where their feet poked the unpierced surface tension, creating dimpled silvery menisci in the space-time-light continuum at this air-water interface through which I quietly protruded. Below, barely visible, tiny fish, nibbling my tickled skin and forming goosebumps as if I were a giant cod and they were cleaner wrasse. And as dusk descended, the cicadas shrilled one last deafening, triumphant, cacophonous chorus, and then fell silent. So silent. It was like the end of an act. Should I applaud? No. I honoured the silence. And what a silence. Is there anything more silent than the pause in the collective soundscape after a mass dusk cicada crescendo? As sounds returned, I heard surprised thoughts say, hey, they didn't see me. Or did they? They'd certainly taken their time, drunk their fill, as if I wasn't there. Why? Because they sensed I was no threat? Because I made no ripples? Or perhaps because they too knew soon there would be none. And they sensed, as I did, that we, every living thing assembled here, would bow to honour the ritual of this sacred sharing. At home now, in Brisbane, 150 kilometres south, as the smoke from too many fires turns parched suburbia orange, I reflect on the two dry forests and the shrinking pools and the tinderbox conditions, and my tears well up. Imagine. Imagine if, imagine if as each tear welled and swelled and slipped away, each free falling gentle teardrop, drop by minuscule drop, could splash and leave a ripple, a ripple, then another, then ripple after ripple, enough to refill that sacred pool, enough to satisfy those dependent on its cool clear waters, enough to replenish that which has filled me more than once so that the cycle of love, mutuality and life could continue. I will keep crying for I believe in my soul that my tears will make a difference even as the fires keep coming.
Wow, Neil, thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you all. Um, thank you so much. That is a, um, a stark and beautiful place for us to end our call today. Um, see you all on the intertubes and next week and hold you all in our hearts. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.